Morning, everyone, and a hearty, happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. Welcome to the Zoom gathering of Summit Unitarian Universalists Fellowship. Uh, in San Diego, we are still in the red zone, so we are forced to, again, not meet in person, but it gives us another week to hone our tech skills here in the sanctuary so that when we do return, we are better than ever. But now to help us into the spirit of worship, let us calm our minds and our hearts and please listen to our prelude from Barbara. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. I will be playing in honor of Father's Day, um, three selections, um, two preludes and an invention from the Klavier Buchlein for Wilhelm Friedemann Bach. This is Bach's son who was nine years old at the time. And his father, who was such a family man, wrote, um, Johann, <laughs> uh, wrote, wrote this, um, this book and left a bunch and, and put in pieces of his own and pieces by other composers and left a lot of blank pages for the son who would become quite a good composer in his own right um, to use. Thank you, Barbara. 
A little business first, I just wanted to let everyone know that I took my COVID test about 20 minutes ago and it came up negative. So that is why I have removed my mask so you can see my face and make it easier to hear and understand what I'm saying. Also, I'd like to reach out to Lynn Feinberg. I hope that she's feeling better. She was supposed to be this morning's Sunday service associate, um, but she was COVID positive and was having symptoms and she was not feeling well earlier this week. So I certainly hope that she is on the mend. And I'd like to welcome you again to Summit's Zoom virtual gathering. Summit is a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles that are drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science, philosophy, and our own personal practices. We are a religion of love and inclusion, and our mission here at Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just, and sustainable world. And of course, if you're anyone new to UUism or to Summit, and would like to know more about us, we invite you to visit our website and fill out our, sorry, click on our visitors button and fill out an online connection card and we'll be happy to follow up with you. As we always do before we start our service, we want to acknowledge that our fellowship physically resides on unceded Kumeyaay land. And that for more than 10,000 years, this land has been and continues to be the home of the Kumeyaay people. And we recognize the violent history of colonization in California, and we honor the legacy of the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay Nation. No announcements as such, but I just want to remind everyone that there is important fellowship business to be conducted after the service today, so please stay on for our community gathering afterwards. Uh, we also have Reverend Everett Howe in our pulpit this morning, so a happy Father's Day to you. And let's continue with our service to by lighting our chalice. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by Kelly Weissman Aspruth Jackson. Does the match love the wick? Does the wick love the match or the wax or the air it consumes? Yes, without question to melt together, to burn together, to change together. The pieces of the candle must love each other, though not necessarily wisely and not necessarily well. Let us join together, please, well muted and sing our UU you, you hymn presented to us both in English and in Spanish to reflect the multilingual culture of our region. Speranza fe amor, verda di viesa cantando, de cada tierra, cada Please join me while staying muted with our UU aspiration. May love be the spirit of this fellowship. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. And now it's time for time for all ages. Good morning, Mary Carter Vale. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, um, and happy Father's Day to all who father and care give in fathering roles and all the complexity that is held 
well, in our experience of fathering. So happy Father's Day. So today, in addition to Father's Day, it is also Juneteenth. So tomorrow is a federal holiday celebrating Juneteenth, but today's the actual Juneteenth. And it only became a federal holiday last year. And it's not yet recognized as a legal holiday in many states still. So what is Juneteenth? It is also known as Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, Jubilee, and has been celebrated for years among descendants of chattel slavery in the United States. It is an Independence Day. It is an Independence Day. Even with all of that, I never celebrated it as a child. I never talked about it in school or made Juneteenth crafts or played games or attended local festivals or barbecues. It was not until I was an adult that I first heard of this holiday. And then I had to do some research to figure out what it was all, what it was all about. And here is some of what I discovered. So June 19th, 1865 was the day that US Major General Gordon Granger issued General Order Number no. Three, which informed the people of Texas that all enslaved people were now free. Granger commanded our headquarters in Texas with, and had, he and his troops had arrived in Galveston on the previous day. To, and he shared this order with the people of Texas. This was two and a half years after the date that President Abraham Lincoln had issued the final Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, freeing those enslaved. So for 901 days, the enslaved people in the state of Texas remained enslaved because the information was not shared. This was 30% of the population for that state. And they were still being treated as property of others. So this is what general order number three states, and I quote, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, that's the president, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. Now, this is incredibly comp complicated. It goes on to say, the freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They, inform, they are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. That's really complicated language, isn't it? Yeah. So for two and a half years, the people of Texas remained enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation freed the rest of the states in the South. Now, can you imagine that? And that's not even all of it. There were two border states that did not secede to join the Confederacy, where slavery remained legal until the ratification of the 13th Amendment on December 6, 1865. So that's even longer. The two states, Delaware and Kentucky, still allowed slavery until the 13th Amendment was ratified six months after Juneteenth. So those folks remained enslaved for three years after the Emancipation Re Proclamation. Wow, I did not learn that in school. Did you? I didn't. Our history is complex and full of difficult and tragic stories. Now, my great, great grandfather was a soldier who fought in the Civil War for the Union. He lost a limb in the Battle of Gettysburg and survived to receive an honorable discharge and become a father to my ancestors. So that's why I'm here. This story that I knew in childhood and in my mind, the story that I had in my mind was that once the Union won the war, all the people were free and all was well. This is not a true story. It is a fiction 
that was allowed to become the story for many years. In truth, it's a very complex story with ramifications that we're still experiencing today. So there is so much to discover about Juneteenth. So do we celebrate this important part of our history, especially for folks who are not descendants of slavery? Is it a celebration for everyone? Yes, it is. We are all invited to celebrate the liberation uh, because our collective liberation liberates us all. How, how do we celebrate Juneteenth? Well, you can attend a celebration. There's one happening today in La Mesa you can go to if you feel like being amongst folks. Um, you could talk to your family and discover your ancestors' connection to our shared history like I learned about my great-grandfather. Um, and most of all, I invite you to do some research to discover the facts around this complicated period in our history and how it still impacts us today. There are, there are some great movies and resources. Um, I highly recommend the 13th to learn more about the 13th Amendment because that's an important part of the story that's even more complex. Um, but learn about what happened. Learn about the emancipation of enslaved people of African descent in the United States. That is our role is to really understand the history not this and beyond the stories, like really dig into it. So our history is complicated and it is our challenge to question, to inquire, to understand so that we can live into our highest aspirations. Now I have several stories about Juneteenth to share with folks who come to our parking lot RE program today at 1230 after the annual meeting. And they include this one called a different, it's all different now by Angela G Lee, Angela Johnson. And this is about the people of Texas when that order number three came through and what their reaction was. And then I have another one about Opal Lee, who is the grandmother of Juneteenth. And Opal Lee is still alive today. She's in her nineties and she will walk two and a half miles this weekend to remember the two and a half years that the people of Texas remained enslaved. So it's important for us to remember. It's important to us to discover. It's important to us to learn what really happened. So come and join us if you'd like after the annual meeting or check out these books from the library, borrow them from me and learn more because we all need to understand our collective history. And that is my story for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Happy Juneteenth to you all. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Tyler, could you put up the slide? As we come to the end of another year, I would like to take a moment to thank all of the volunteers who work behind the scenes to make Summit what it is. Summit is not a spectator sport. We have a very small handful of part-time employees who support us in our work of being a spiritual community. We have so many members and friends who work together to help us gather weekly for services, who work to make the world a better place, who help us build connections between each other, and who do the nuts and bolts work of keeping our fellowship up and running. I want to thank all of you for your contributions to our community. If we were all in person today, I'd ask people to stand if they volunteered in any of these categories listed on the slide. And I'm sure that most of the congregation would be standing, many in multiple categories. So when someone asks you if you would like to help, please consider saying yes and try something new. Fresh ideas from new members, always a good way for groups to grow and evolve. Plus, 
You get to try your hand at something new and get to know new folks. Thank you all for helping make Summit the community that we are. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't also thank you for your tireless leadership and tireless work, especially being president of the board. So thank you for all that you do. This morning's reading is a passage from The Longing for Home by Frederick Buchner. I recognize that even in the valley of the shadow of my own tangled thoughts, there is something holy and unutterable seeking to restore my soul. <coughs> I always stop and touch the coarse gray bark of one particular tree with my hand or cheek, which I suppose is a way of blessing it for being so strong and beautiful. Who knows how long it has been standing there wearing its foliage like a crown, even though a part of it's dying. Because of that quality of sheer endurance, one morning I found myself touching it, not to bless it, but to ask its blessing so that I myself might move toward old age and death with something like its stunning grace and courage. Summit is a fellowship that's supported entirely by the voluntary generosity of its members and friends, and we greatly appreciate our faithful pledgers who continue to keep up their monthly contributions. We make it as easy as we possibly can to make a donation to our virtual play today. The link can be found in the chat box and take you directly to the donation location. And now we will gratefully accept your generous donations while we listen to our musical interlude. Once again, Barbara. Thinking of a type of music that is all about change. This is the variations, actually it's, it's the theme and three of the variations on an Egyptian folk theme by Gamal Abdal Rahim of Egypt.
Please join me now in the spirit of prayer or meditation. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we pause in the midst of our busy day, in the midst of our busy lives to give thanks. To give thanks for simple things like waking up and having that first sip of our coffee or tea or favorite morning beverage. We give thanks for our friends. We give thanks for the natural world around us, whether that be the potted plant in our living room or the vast natural spaces outdoors. We give thanks for the community of our fellowship, which supports us in our spiritual quests. And this Father's Day, we give thanks for the fathers and the father figures who have helped us in our lives. There may be fathers in your life who have harmed you or who have removed themselves from your life. We pray for those of us who have experienced this. There may be fathers or father figures in your lives who are not related to you biologically our adoptive fathers, our stepfathers, our chosen fathers, our chosen mentors. We give thanks for the supportive presence of these fathers. There are some of us who have longed to become fathers, but who have not been able to do so, or who have not yet found that way. There are some of us who have lost children through death or through emotional separation. We recognize you. We pray for you. We support you. There are some of us who have lost our fathers, again, through death or through emotional separation. We recognize this loss as well and all the feelings that come with it. There are some of us who are expecting to enter fatherhood soon. We share your joy and anticipation. So let us pause now to reflect with gratitude on the many forms of fatherhood that appear in our lives and in our communities. Amen and blessed be. And now as we appreciate the thoughts of change, of our changing relationships, let us consider a song about the importance of change. wrestling waves to find a boulder I could cling to a stone to hold me fast where I might let the fretful waters of this river around me pass and so I found an anchor a blessed resting place a trusty rock I to it protect me and the rock replied God is the river and that 
just a stone God is a wild raging rapid and a slow meandering flow God is a deep and narrow passage and a peaceful sandy shore God is the river swimmer so let go Still I clung to my rock tightly with conviction in my eyes Never looking at the stream to keep my mind from thoughts of mine But the river kept on coming, kept on tugging at my eyes Till at last my fingers faltered and I was swept away So I'm going with the flow now, these relentless twists and bends, acclimating to the motion and a sense of being man. And this river's like my body now, it carries me along through the ever changing seas and by the rocks that sing this song. just a stone. God is a wild raging rapid and a slow meandering flow. God is a deep and narrow passage and a peaceful sandy shore. God is the river swimmer, so let go. God is the river swimmer. So let go Our monthly worship theme for June is blessings. And I feel the need to pause for a moment and think of the blessings of the music that we have from Barbara, from Karen, from the many musicians who have created the videos that we have been using for the past two years. They have added so much to our worship. So our monthly theme is blessings. And as we come to the close of one congregational year and are ready to enter a new one, we are also facing change. So the title of this service is The Blessings of Change. I had initially hoped to spend much of this sermon talking in general about change in our lives and how we respond to it about how we are always tempted to cling to that rock in the river, looking for stability, but that God is the river and not the stone, and that our lives are more meaningful when we change and grow. I will still be talking about change, but mostly this talk will be about the particular changes to our congregation that are coming up and in particular, my role as your minister. Now, don't worry, I will be here for another year, or maybe do worry, I will be here for another year. The choice is yours. But let me tell you about the time that I have already spent with you. Summit was already going to be in store for a big change when Reverend Frank announced his retirement. He had a long, productive, beautiful ministry with you. And no matter what, there would be things to adjust to when you found a new minister, and hopefully a full-time called minister. 
And my role in the congregation as a part-time minister during this time of transition was to help support you as you went through the search process. Now, it was way back in the early months of 2020 that Summit's board and I negotiated my contract. It was to be for one year with the expectation that it would be renewed for a second year. The plan for the congregation that first year was that you would work on financial issues, the biggest one being to pay off the mortgage to reduce your annual expenses. And once this was done, and it did get done, it's beautiful. It would be easier to see exactly how much money there was available for staffing and for hiring a new minister. The plan for the second year was that the congregation would go into search for a called minister, hopefully at full time. But once again, that would depend on financing. The board and I also talked about my position. What would I be doing as a halftime minister? And halftime, it would have to be both because financing was tight and also because I needed and still need time for the work that I continue to do in math research. And the problem is that there are some things that are difficult to do half time. Staff supervision, for example. Mark and Mary and Linda and I met every week for the past two years to discuss what was going on in the congregation and to coordinate the tasks we were responsible for. And as it turns out, this coordination was even more critical than we had imagined at the beginning of 2020, as we've had to deal with all of the situations that came up as we live through and continue to live through this pandemic. This takes a certain amount of time, which can't really be cut in half. Other programs are also difficult to cut in half. Providing the covenant group topic sheet and meeting with the covenant group leaders each month takes a certain amount of time and it can't be reduced unless the groups get fewer topics. Board meetings, finance committee meetings, Sunday service committee meetings, caring committee meetings, committee and ministry meetings, safe reopening task force meetings. There was really no good way to reduce these commitments because if I only went to every other meeting, or left halfway through, I would quickly lose touch with these groups. And some things we decided I would just provide less support for. So for instance, Summit's social justice programs have traditionally been strong and well supported by lay leaders. So my support for Summit's social justice has mostly been limited to addressing issues in sermons. In my first year, for instance, I supported the social just, justice in action team's effort to bring the eighth principle to the congregation for a vote. I supported these efforts by addressing topics related to the eighth principle in my sermons. But for the past two years, social justice in action has been led by capable and dedicated lay leaders with little participation from me. When the board and I were working out my contract for that first year, there were two big areas of ministerial support that we had to think hard about, preaching and pastoral care. Preaching is the easier of the two to understand because it is so visible. A full-time minister will typically preach between 30 and 35 times over the course of the year, plus one or two special services like Christmas Eve is for Summit. Half of that would be about 16 services plus Christmas Eve. My first year contract was for 20 services plus Christmas Eve, and in the second year for 18 services plus Christmas. Both years, this was more than half time, and this was an intentional choice. The idea was that leading a service is a very visible role for the congregation, and it's a way for the congregation to get to know the minister. We felt that would be important, especially in my first year. But where does that leave pastoral care? 
When you think of pastoral care, your mind might jump to personal crises. You're in the hospital and the minister comes to check in on you. You're going through a divorce and your minister provides moral support. But pastoral care is more than that. Pastoral care works best when you and your minister have a chance to talk about things when they aren't going wrong. Your minister can find out what you are hoping for in your life. What are the things that are bothering you? Where do you find your spiritual strength? What do you do to help keep your life in balance? Where do you find the divine? Pastoral care in the congregational setting is not about the minister helicoptering in during a crisis. It is about growing relationships. It's about the slow process of building trust. It's about support in your daily life, building up a strong base of support through small interactions and longer pastoral conversations long before a crisis comes. When a crisis does happen, this base of support is invaluable. If you know that your minister knows your hopes, your dreams, and your struggles, if you have learned to trust them, then it's much easier to talk about your illness or your divorce or whatever it is that's going on. Pastoral care takes time and nurturing. And this is where something had to give. Full-time staff and committee support and more than half-time preaching meant that pastoral care was going to have to be catch as catch can. This choice that the board and I made way back in January and February of 2020 was a tough one, but we figured we would try it and see how it worked. We'll try it for a year, maybe two, and then you'll get a new minister, was the thought, hopefully at much more than half time. Essentially, we thought, let's defer maintenance. If you've ever been responsible for the upkeep of a home or a building, deferred maintenance is always a tempting way to reduce your expenses. And we thought that we could probably go easy on the pastoral care for a year or maybe two, and then a full-time minister would show up and start rebuilding those pastoral connections. Then the pandemic came. That first year, it became clear to me that Summit needed more pastoral care, more pastoral support. There is some maintenance that cannot be deferred without harm. But I was unable to provide this support with the time I had available. And so in the spring of 2020, we found a little more money in the budget and we hired Reverend Luna to be available for a few hours each week for pastoral care. She was able to relieve some of the stress, but she was unable to continue after June, 2021. Now in this past year's budget, we had some more money, partly because of the successful paying off of our mortgage. And in theory, we could have increased my time a little bit, but as I spoke about a few weeks ago, the time that I have set aside for my math work is important for my well-being. I can't work more than half time at Summit because the other half of my working time is spent doing things that contribute to my mental and emotional health and that make it possible to be present for you as a minister. So we searched for a 20% time pastoral care minister with that little extra bit of money. It took some time to find someone and you might have noticed last October that I did not preach at all that month because the board okayed removing two of my preaching dates so that I could do more pastoral care. During that October, I ended up having extended pastoral conversations with about 15 people. But there were no local ministers available to take on a part-time pastoral job, so our search for a pastoral care minister led us farther afield. We found Reverend Casey, who started working with us in November. Reverend Casey has been a great resource. 
But since they live in Los Angeles, they were limited to phone, email, and Zoom. And now they are moving away to a great full-time job in Washington, DC. Reverend Casey and the board and I all agree that there was also an issue with familiarity. People did not have a chance to really get to know Reverend Casey, so they were less likely to think, hey, maybe I should chat with them about how things are going on in my life. So what is the plan for the coming year? How will Summit get the pastoral care that it needs? A third year of deferred maintenance is not an option. So after some consideration, we decided on a new plan. I will provide pastoral care for Summit in this coming year. At this point, I hope that most of you are pretty familiar with me, both from my sermons and for some of you with your experience with me at uh, committees. I hope that you will feel comfortable talking with me and that if I reach out to you, I hope you will feel that a short phone call or uh, an appointment for a coffee will be helpful. We can build some of those pastoral relationships that will pay off when you find yourself in need. But how will this fit into part-time ministry? The short answer is that I will be preaching much less often, but you will actually see me more often on Sundays. To help support the Sunday service committee, I will be the service associate about every other week that will help remind you that I still exist. And when our services uh, include in-person meetings again, it will give you a chance to chat with me briefly after the service, just to check in and maybe to make an appointment for a talk later on in the week. But instead of preaching every three weeks as I have been doing this year, I will preach about once every eight weeks. I know that some of you have appreciated my sermons, and it might be a disappointment to hear me less often. But on the positive side, we will have a wider variety of voices in the pulpit. And I think it will be valuable for Summit in the long run to see clearly what less than full-time ministry looks like. Deferred maintenance is invisible until the problems start cropping up. And many of you may not have even realized how little pastoral care I have had time for. If people are more aware of the limitations of halftime ministry, I hope that those of you who have not yet pledged support to this congregation will consider what level of support you expect from the congregation and help step up by volunteering, by contributing money. At the moment in our pledge drive, the donations that we are furthest behind in are the smaller ones measured in hundreds of dollars per year. So whatever you can give that will help this community and increase your participation in it. Because the truth is, if a congregation doesn't pay for full-time ministry, it is not going to receive full-time ministry. And Summit has been used to full-time ministry. One final upcoming change that I would like to mention. Before I came to Summit, I applied for and received a fellowship to spend time at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand to teach a course and to spend some time with colleagues there doing research. We've postponed this both because of COVID and because of my job at Summit, but now I have to either take this opportunity or lose it. So while I am willing to work at Summit for a third year, in addition to the two years that we initially envisioned way back in 2020, I will be taking July and August away from Summit in order to take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity. A local UU minister, the Reverend Tanya Marquez has agreed to provide limited pastoral care support while I am away. 
She will be preaching at the end of July, and I hope you will get an opportunity to meet her earlier in the month. Stay tuned for more information about that. Reverend Tanya is working full-time as a chaplain, which is why her time with us will be limited to a few hours per week. But she has a wonderful pastoral presence, and she is an accomplished preacher. We are very lucky to have her with us for the months that I will be away. It is hard to let go of the rock when you have been longing for stability. And if there's anything that many of us have been longing for these past few years, it's been stability. But swimming in the river is the only way for us to grow and thrive. I am excited. I am thrilled, truly, for this new way that I will have of being with you in the coming year. I hope you will be able to find time to meet with me if I reach out to you when I return in September. When I do so, let's talk. May it be so. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. The words of Reverend Eric Walker Wickstrom. If you are who you were, and if the person next to you is who they were, if none of us has changed since the day we came in here, we have failed. The purpose of this community, of any church, temple, zendo, mosque, the purpose is to help its people grow. We do this through encounters with the unknown, in ourselves, in others, in the other, whoever that might be for us, however hard that might be, because these encounters have many gifts to offer. So may you go forth this morning, not who you were, but who you could be. So may we all. 